We were speaking about the Prophet ﷺ in Ji'rana, where he had dis distributed the spoils, or should I say what was left behind by the people of Hawazin and Thaqif after they had fled from the Battle of Hunayn. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. I said yesterday that Zayd ibn Haritha was the one who had collected the, or who was instructed by the Prophet ﷺ to gather all that was left behind by the enemy. In fact, it was Zayd ibn Thabit, radiallahu anhu. It was a slip of the tongue, Zayd ibn Thabit. As for Zayd ibn Haritha, radiallahu anhu, he was martyred already in Mu'ta, as we had mentioned a few days earlier. So that was just a point of clarification I intended to commence with. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spent 13 nights in Ji'rana. Thereafter, he wore his ihram. He proceeded to Mecca al mukarramah He made Umrah by night, and he returned to Al-Madinah al munawwara he had returned to Medina after an absence from Medina Munawwara of almost two and a half months. Because he had gone the victory of Mecca, the battle of Hunayn, he had spent 13 nights in Ji'rana, and now he was coming back. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very interesting incident I'd like to make mention of. After that battle of Hunayn, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was brought a female by the name of a Shayma bint al Harith. And what happened? As she was from amongst the prisoners of war, she said, look, I am the sister of this man. I am the sister of this man who is your leader, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they did not believe her. They brought her to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She said, I am your sister, foster sister. I am the daughter of Halima to Sa'diyya, your foster mother. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked her, what is the sign of that? So she says, I have a mark on my back. Whilst I was carrying you, you had made a mark on me and I recall that, subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ remembered that and then he spoke to her very well and he told her, look, you have a choice. Either you can remain with us as a guest or we can give you something and you can return to your land. She said, perhaps I would like to return to my land, to Banu Sa'ad. And she was permitted to leave by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She accepted Islam on her way out. As she was leaving, when she saw this man, who was actually her brother, foster brother. She had accepted Islam. This was also an interesting story we decided to make mention of. Now al Madinah al munawwara became the capital of the Muslim nation. And the Prophet wasallam had sent governors to the various regions and the various areas. We won't make mention of the names of each one of them, but it was amazing how this was done. The expertise of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, divine revelation, came to him instructing him what to do. And he had sent governors and ran it as a country, subhanallah. Today, the countries have to take a page and a lesson from what happened at that time in order to know what to do in their different provinces and so on. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had started this. And when it comes to the idols that were being worshipped at the time, there were two or three different types of idols. One, the idols on the Kaaba. We saw that those were all destroyed the day of the victory of Mecca. Secondly, the little idols that people had had in their homes. These were destroyed by them themselves within their homes as they accepted Islam. Thirdly, there were some huge idols which were in specific places, which were frequented by the people of the regions. And they used to pay homage to these and they used to go for a pilgrimage to some of these places where the idols are or were. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one by one sent platoons and little armies and battalions of the army to these different places in order to destroy these idols that were on the or in the Muslim land. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had sent quite a few of these platoons, alhamdulillah. And by this, the idol worshipping or the shirk within the entire region was slowly brought to a halt. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all protection from associating partners with him. For indeed, we are to worship him alone, the maker, the nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector, curer, the one in absolute control of every aspect of my existence and yours, Rabbul Alameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us forgiveness. In the same year, the eighth year of Hijrah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lost another daughter of his. Zainab binti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She fell ill when she had come from Mecca to al on the Hijrah. 
she was separated from her husband Al-Aus ibn Rabi'ah radiyallahu anhu who was at that time a mushrik and later on when he accepted Islam and came to Mecca to Al-Mukarramah he was united with his wife she then passed away in the eighth year of Hijrah and this was the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now he had only two daughters left Umm Kulthum radiyallahu anha and Fatima binti Muhammad radiyallahu anha it had happened whilst the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was in Mecca that a woman from a noble clan had stolen. Her name was Fatima al makhzumiyah In fact, her name was the Makhzumi woman. She was known as the lady from the Makhzum tribe who had stolen. And you know the punishment for stealing. They had tried to talk to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why don't you forgive her? She's from a very high lofty clan and so on. So they thought, let's speak to Usama bin Zaid radiallahu an, one of the most loved by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Perhaps he can go and speak to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and get her off the hook, so to speak. When he went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he became red. He was upset. He says, Atashfa'u fi haddim min hududillah. You want to try and intercede regarding one of the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Waymullahi, law anna Fatima binta Muhammadin saraqat laqata'atu yadaha. Behold, even if the daughter of Muhammad, Fatima binti Muhammad, radiallahu an, anha, had to steal, I would have also cut her hand off, meaning she would not have got away with that particular punishment just because she was my daughter. Then he uttered the famous statement, Innama ahlaka man kana qablakum. Definitely, one of the reasons why those before you were destroyed was because when the noble people used to commit crime, they were let off. And when those who were paupers committed crime, they were always taken to task. And in this way, the Prophet ﷺ said, the nations were destroyed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and a lesson from this. Thereafter, the Prophet ﷺ had sent Al-Walid ibn Uqbah ibn Abi Mu'ayyad to the people of Banu al-Mustaliq who had accepted Islam in order to collect their charities. When zakat had become farad and so on, we spoke about it just after the hijrah. And now that he went to, uh, or he sent uh, the son of Uqbah, Ibn Abi Mu'ayyid, whose name was Al-Walid Ibn Uqbah, to collect the zakah. As this man went, the people of Banu al-Mustaliq were so happy that they came out with their armor and with their swords and so on. When they came out, rushed towards him, he thought they want to attack him. So he ran back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in Medina Munawwara and said, Banu al-Mustaliq have now turned back upon their deen, from their deen, and Banu al-Mustaliq have reneged. So what happened? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu amongst a few men to go to Banu al-Mustaliq and find out what had happened. So when Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu went towards Banu al-Mustaliq, he waited on the outskirts and he heard the adhan. When he heard the adhan of Salatul Asr, he knew immediately that this means these people have not reneged, nor have they turned back. But perhaps there was something that had happened when he got to them, they explained. And this is when verses were revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> فَتُصْبِحُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلْتُمْ نَادِمِينَ O you who believe, when a sinful person comes to you with news, always authenticate it before you believe it, because you may then harm people without knowledge and you will be regretful for what you have done. So this means two things. One is, when a sinful person comes to you with news, you need to authenticate it. That's the point number one. Without authentication, you are on the wrong side. That's it. Point number two. When a person comes to you backbiting about someone, he becomes sinful by the mere nature of his backbiting. Therefore, never believe it before authenticating completely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So this verse has a twofold meaning. One is... When someone comes to you with information that is important, authenticate it, if that person is not of sound credentials. Number two, 
if a person comes to you with something that is not connected to you, that is backbiting, by nature of him coming with that, he becomes sinful. So don't accept it, don't believe it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. May he make us from those whose own weaknesses occupy us from engaging in the weaknesses of others. Remember, our lives are such that if we were to spend them correctly, we would not have time to look at what other people are doing. We, each moment that we look at others, point at them, speak about them, we are actually causing harm to ourselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us forgiveness and may He grant us lesson. There is also a story of how one of the most generous people of the pagan Arabs, whose name was Hatim al Ta'i, he was such a generous man that he would give the last drop of food he had for his guests. It is reported that once there were people who had come to his place and he had no food at all. And they came there and they asked for food. And he tells them, Atas'alunani an ta'ami wa ibili amamak. You are asking me about food? He knew, they knew his house was empty. You are asking me about food? And you can see the camel I was riding on is right in front of you. Which means here's the food. Subhanallah, I'm ready to sacrifice the camel I'm riding on. But I'm not ready to let my uh, guests go without a meal. Subhanallah. This was the man who was a very generous man in the pagan days of Arabia. And he was known from the, from the time he was young as a very generous person. This man had not accepted Islam, but his daughter was amongst the captives once when Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu was sent to an area. They brought her to Rasulullah She told the messenger, I am Safana, the daughter of Hatim al -Ta i so what happened is, the Prophet ﷺ said, We will be generous to you because we have heard of the generosity of you and your family. Subhanallah. So the Prophet ﷺ released her, gave her something, some provisions and some gifts and released her. Later on, it's reported that she accepted Islam. She told her brother, whose name was Adi ibn Hatim, who had run away to Asham, to the Syrian region. He had run away when the Muslims were entering and... When she told him of what had happened, he decided, let me go and see what this is all about, subhanAllah. So he arrives in Medina Munawwara and he sees the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the ninth year of Hijrah. And subhanAllah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was busy with an old woman talking to her on the path. And he spent his time. So this man says, he is not a king because kings don't do this. And then when he welcomed him into the home and told him who he was, the Prophet ﷺ gave him a place to sit. And this man saw the simplicity of the home of the Messenger ﷺ. And he was offered so much and good speech by Rasulullah ﷺ. In no time did he decide to accept Islam. When the Prophet ﷺ told him, Aslim Taslam, O Adi ibn Hatim. Enter the fold of Islam and you will be saved. Saved from the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aslim means to surrender to the law of Allah. The message is for every one of us. Aslim, Taslam. Surrender to the law of Allah and you will be saved by it or from the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. Now we move into one of the major battles that took place in the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the final battle that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took part in in his life. This is the battle of Tabuk. They call it the expedition of Tabuk. And there was so much to be learned from this particular battle that if you take a look at the books of Sirah, they have spent a lot of time discussing this particular battle. More than the war itself, the lessons were from the moment the battle was announced to even after the messenger had returned to Medina Munawwara, what happened on the way and what happened on the way back and what happened when they returned, subhanAllah. Firstly, the Prophet ﷺ was informed by the business people, by the traders who used to come from the Roman Empire, meaning from the Syrian region that was under the Roman Empire, when they were passing Medina Munawwara, they were told, or they told Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Romans are preparing a huge army in order to attack you. Why was this? This was for many reasons. One is, Islam became a power. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became a force to be reckoned with. 
And at the same time, there was the battle of Mu'ta that had taken place where they had been served a heavy blow by the Muslims, although the Muslims were in very small numbers, headed later on by Khalid ibn al-Walid after the martyrdom of the three other leaders. So because of these reasons, they were preparing. When the Prophet ﷺ heard this, he said, no, let us prepare, we will go and meet them. Why should they come and perhaps massacre us here in our own homes and on our streets? We'd rather go and meet them outside. So this, subhanallah, was the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the announcement, it was the first time that he told them openly where he is going. Usually he wouldn't say where he is going. He would just prepare the army and then start marching. They would find out later on. This time he told them, we are going to Tabuk and we are going to fight the Romans and this is why we are going to fight them and we need every single able-bodied person to join us because we need to go out in large numbers. Now, it was in the time of severe heat. At the same time, Tabuk, very, very far, perhaps 780 miles from Medina Munawar, which is a long distance and in the heat. And then they did not have much in terms of provision because of the crop and the produce. And at the same time, they had few animals to carry. Tens of thousands of them, subhanAllah. So much so that at the end, they had had quite a few animals. 18 companions were sharing one camel on the path. So they walked it, basically. Imagine, they walked it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and a lesson. Look at the sacrifice of these companions. So they had a few animals and at the same time they did not have much merchandise in the kitty of the Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us lesson. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided to get up and make an announcement in the masjid. We need wealth because they were from amongst the Sahaba wealthy people. But the Baytul Mal, the, uh, the Muslims amount that they would have had for themselves, the the amount belonging to the Muslim nation was not much at the time. But individual Muslims were wealthy. So the Prophet ﷺ called out. He spoke to them. And there is a hadith of Abdurrahman ibn Khubab radiallahu anhu in Sunan al-Tirmidhi which makes mention of how the Prophet ﷺ began to encourage his companions go and get whatever you can give and bring it. We need to go to Tabuk. So he says, Uthman ibn Affan came back with 100 saddled camels. And when the messenger continued to encourage the people, Uthman ibn Affan went back and brought another 100 saddled camels. And when he continued to encourage them, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu went back and brought another 100. Some narrations say it stopped at 300 saddled camels and some narrations take it right up to 900 to 1,000 camels. This man, Uthman ibn Affan, but what is correct is the Prophet ﷺ came down from the mimbar. He was so delighted by what he saw. He continued repeating, Ma ala Uthman, ma amila ba'da hadi. Uthman doesn't need to do anything after this. This is his jannah. This is what he has earned. He doesn't need to do anything after this. And Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu had already given 1,000 gold coins for that particular battle. And on top of that, he was still giving hundreds of camels one after the other. He hears an encouragement, he goes, he brings it. He hears a little bit more, he went, he brought it. Subhanallah. This was Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. As for Umar ibn al-Khattab, he was in his home looking for whatever he could bring. He decided, I'm going to take half of my wealth. And today, inshallah, by the will of Allah, I want to bring more than Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. It was not in order to show off, not at all, but it was in order to compete with one another in terms of goodness. Imagine you bring in an amount and a dua for you. Look at the statement made for Uthman ibn Affan. If they had to achieve that statement, they were winners. So when Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu came with a lot, a lot, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him a question. Ma abqayta li ahlik? What is it that you've left for your family? So he looked, he says, mithluhu. Just like this, which means half. This is half, and that which I've left at home is half. So Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu making dua that Allah accepts it. Suddenly Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu comes with a large amount, large amount. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted it and asked him a question. What have you left for your family? 
He looks at the messenger and he says, I've left Allah and his messenger. Which means this is everything I have. Everything completely that I own is here. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu says on that day, I said, لا أسابقك إلى شيء أبدا. I'm never going to compete with this man again. I cannot. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. This battle of Tabuk. Remember, he brought every droplet he had when he was asked, what did you leave for your family? I have left Allah and his message. Here we have two hands. We will work before the end of the day. We put a plate of food in front of our family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us generosity. May he make us from those who learn a lesson. Now, there were some who had spent on that day. From amongst them was Abdurrahman ibn Awf. He gave a large amount. Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib gave a large amount. Talha ibn Ubaidillah radiallahu anhum jami'an. They gave large amounts as well as Muhammad ibn Maslama. He was a warrior. He had given a lot in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on this occasion, he gave so much, subhanallah, including Asim ibn Adi radiallahu anh. These people had given a lot. Now, they were some hypocrites. The hypocrites were sitting and each time someone brings something, they had one of two comments. When someone brings a lot, they said, this man is boasting and is showing off. That was a statement. And when someone brings a little, like there was a man who did not have anything. And remember the messenger never belittled even the smallest amount that was given in charity. He never belittled it. No matter how small it was, he accepted it. Subhanallah. This was charity. This was for the cause of the deen. And so one man didn't have much. He, it is reported he worked all night and he decided whatever I get, he worked for a time. Whatever I get, I'm going to give half to the cause of Tabuk. So the following day he was given one measurement of dates and he brought half of that measurement. One narration says he brought the measurement of dates and he presented it. So the hypocrites began to laugh at him. And they said, Inna Allah la ghaniyun an Allah is independent. He doesn't need this little measurement that this man is bringing. And verses were revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, admonishing these people. Al-ladheena yalmizoon al-muttawwi'eena min al-mu'mineena fi al-sadaqati wal-ladheena la yajidoon illa juhdahum fayaskharoon minhum sakhir Allah minhum those who are making a mockery out of those who are giving voluntarily towards this particular expedition in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are making a mockery out of the people who are giving voluntarily. Allah says, Allah will make a mockery of them for indeed the punishment is most severe. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. May he protect us from making a mockery of those who are trying to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us at all times. And this is why it is very important for us to know that every time we would like to give a charity, it does not need to be something big. Even if it is something small, do not underestimate its value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah accept us and may he open our doors. So as they, had, as they were preparing this army, there were some who came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam presenting excuses. You know, I have this problem, I have that problem, and I'd like to stay behind, I have to stay behind. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam declared that which Allah had instructed him to declare. What was that? Every one of you have to come out completely, without exception, unless you have a valid excuse, then you may remain. Or unless you do not have the means to carry yourself. You cannot afford to come out because of financial terms or because of financial condition. So the Prophet ﷺ was visited by these hypocrites who came to him and told him, we, are, we have this problem, so he excused some of them. We have this problem, he excused some of them. We have this problem, we, he excused some of them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses later on. لما أذنت لهم حتى يتبين لك الذين صدقوا وتعلم الكاذبين. Allah has forgiven you. How could you have permitted them to stay behind without verifying who was truthful and who was actually lying? Then the law came down immediately after that verse. لا يستأذنك الذين يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر 
أن يجاهدوا بأموالهم وأنفسهم Those who truly believe in Allah and His Messenger will never ever excuse themselves from taking part when it comes to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the battle, the expedition here being spoken about was the expedition of Tabuk. And they will never excuse themselves to use their wealth or for themselves to come out. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. The next verse says, the only people who will excuse themselves are those who don't believe in Allah and His Messenger truly. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then makes the exception. لَيْسَ عَلَى الضُّعَفَاءِ وَلَا عَلَى الْمَرْضَى there is no harm upon those who are weak and those who are sick. They can remain behind. No harm upon those who cannot afford it. Once they understand what is required of them, if they still cannot afford it, no harm upon them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا عَلَى الَّذِينَ إِذَا مَا أَتَوْكَ لِتَحْمِلَهُمْ قُلْتَ لَا أَجِدُ مَا أَحْمِلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ تَوَلَّوْا وَأَعْيُنُهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ حَزَنًا أَلَّا يَجِدُوا مَا يُنْفِقُونَ No harm upon those whom when you go to take them, they don't have anything to carry themselves upon or you tell them that I don't have any means to take you upon, which means the transport is depleted and we cannot take you. Allah says, they turn around crying, weeping. On those people, there is no harm. We have forgiven them. They are excused from taking part. And it is reported that yes, they were some of these people who were crying because they could not go with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of this as well. Then Allah speaks about the hypocrites and those who were presenting excuses. Allah says, لَوْ كَانَ عَرَضًا قَرِيبًا وَسَفَرًا قَاصِدًا If you were going to somewhere close by, Tabuk was very far. If you were going somewhere close by, perhaps they would have followed you. Or if you were going to a place where there was easy access to the spoils of war, they would have followed you. So these people are greedy and lazy. May Allah protect us from greed and laziness. And Allah says, definitely, they shall be served a severe punishment, those who have remained behind without any excuse. And Allah says, وَسَيَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ لَوْ إِسْتَطَعْنَا لَخَرَجْنَا مَعَكُمْ They will swear oaths by Allah that if we were able, we would have come out with you. Allah says, وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ إِنَّهُمْ لَكَاذِبُونَ Allah knows that they are telling a lie. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that they are telling a lie. These hypocrites, what did they say? They went to some of the others who were with the army. And they began to tell them, it's too hot, don't go. How can you people go out in the heat? Just make an excuse and you'll be excused. Stay. What did they say? La fil Don't come out in this heat. So Allah responds, Qul naru jahannama ashaddu harra. Tell them, the fire of Jahannam is even more hot. Allahu Akbar. You're trying to tell people, don't go because of the weather. Don't go because it's hot. Remember the fire of Jahannam is even more hot. So you need to learn to laugh less and to cry more. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all a lesson. The verse was then revealed. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you who believe. Now, this is because the numbers were being made, built up of the people of Mecca, the people of Medina, the Ansar, the Muhajireen, the Arabs, the Bedouins, all the people put together, everyone clustered together as many as possible. So Allah says, O you who believe, مَا لَكُمْ إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ فِرُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ ثَاقَلْتُمْ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ What is wrong with you? When you are being told to come out on the expedition and to go out for this particular battle, then you find yourselves heavy on the ground and you don't want to come out. What is it? Is it that you have become pleased with this worldly life in comparison to the akhirah, to the life after death? 
So these were some of the verses of encouragement, encouraging the people to leave. And mashallah, the army was prepared. 30,000 men, 30,000 men, the largest army in the history of Islam up to that particular time. Or should I say, in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you take a look, there were 10,000 horsemen. 10,000 horsemen. Six years earlier, there were only two horsemen. Subhanallah. In six years, look at what has happened. Six years ago, there were 313 people in Badr. Now, six years later, there are 30,000 people. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant strength to Islam. Remember one thing. If you are not going to serve Allah, He replaces you with others. Sometimes He replaces you with 10 people. May Allah protect us. So Allah does not lose by us turning away. It is us who lose. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then set the flags. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu had the main flag of the entire army. The flag of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was held by Zubair ibn al-Awwam. The flag of the Aws was held by Usaid ibn Hudayr. And the flag of al-Khazraj was held by Abu Dujana radiallahu anhum jami'an. And the army began to march. The hypocrites come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him, we have built a masjid very close to Masjid Quba. We have built a masjid and we want you, before you go out to Tabuk, to bless it, at least read a little bit of Salah in it, so that it can be considered the opening of the masjid and people can start coming in. The Prophet ﷺ told them, when I am coming back, inshaAllah. If Allah wills, when I am coming back, we will look into that. And the Prophet ﷺ then proceeded and he progressed. As the army moved, subhanAllah, we need to remember a few things. The Battle of Hunayn, not a very long time ago, only 12,000 people. Here we have 30,000 men, 10,000 horsemen, subhanAllah, within the 30,000. And as I had said, the camels were still short. They were still less. 18 companions for one camel. Imagine, they were taking turns. Do you know what is the beauty of all this? The Prophet wasallam himself also took turns. He was not exempted from this. In fact, the Sahaba would not have minded, but he considered himself one of them, and he decided, I also need to change with whoever is with me. The team that was with him, he exchanged with them as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson from this as well. So, as they had gone, the army got to a place known as Al-Jurf, Al-Jurf, the outskirts of Medina Munawwara. And the, uh, the army continued. As it progressed, people continued joining because people were closing all their business and affairs and then joining the army. Every time a name is mentioned that this person is left behind, the Prophet ﷺ would pass one statement. He would say, leave him. If there is goodness in him, Allah will bring him here. And if there is no goodness in him, we will be saved from his evil. Subhanallah. This was the statement uttered every time. When they mentioned the name, this man is not with us. He would say the same thing, leave him. If there is goodness in him, Allah will bring him. No goodness, Allah will save us from his evil. And this statement continued until they made mention of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Where is Abu Dhar? Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu, he was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very pious man. Many narrations, many ahadith narrated by him. This man, he was not one of those who stayed behind without an excuse. But his camel gave in. It was very slow, so he was far behind. What he decided to do, take all his provisions, put them on his back, and start walking. And he decided to use a path through the desert in order to be a shortcut so that it could get to where the army was. And as he's walking from a distance, the army sees one man walking alone. So the Prophet ﷺ is told there is one man far off there. As they look at him, they don't recognize him. When he draws a little bit near, they say, that is Abu Dhar. He is walking with all his provisions on his back and he's coming towards us. Subhanallah. This was the goodness of Abu Dhar. The Prophet ﷺ made a dua for him. This Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet ﷺ says, رحم الله أبا ذر يمشي وحده ويموت وحده. Allah have mercy on this Abu Dhar. He's walking all on his own. 
he will also die all on his own. This was a prophecy, a miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now I want to pause for a moment and take you years later at the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, when Abu Dar's death was near. Where was he? He was in a place known as Rabada. Him, his wife, and one of his servants. And he passed away and on his deathbed he tells his wife, if I pass away, you wash my body and you enshroud it and thereafter stand on the path and anyone who comes, let them assist in the burial, tell them this is the body of Abu Dhar. So what happened? He passed away, he was given the wash and enshrouding and thereafter they were waiting on the path in Rabada, very far away. And as the people are passing, caravans are passing, they are saying this is Abu Dhar. People don't know him. Until Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu passed with a group of people. And when he passed, he said, who is this? He was told, this is the janazah of Abu Dhar. Immediately he yelled, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. I remember clearly the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon the expedition of Tabuk saying that Abu Dhar will pass away singularly on his own. And here he is. This was a prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam going out the battle of Tabuk. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may he grant us the ranks of these Sahaba and may he make us even a little portion similar to them for indeed that is where we should be aiming. So this was the story of Abu Dharr al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu. And then the, the army proceeded. They passed a place where the people of Thamud had been destroyed. Known as Hijr Thamud or known as Madayan Saleh. And when they passed the place, some of the companions went in to try and look and so on. The Prophet ﷺ told them, لا تدخلوا مساكن الذين ظلموا إلا باكين. Do not enter the homes of those who were oppressors, those who were destroyed by Allah, except in the condition of weeping and in the condition of being fearful that that must not happen to us as well. Now this was a condition laid by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why do I make mention of this? Today we go to the pyramids, we go to Petra, we go to Madai and Saleh, we go everywhere, the Dead Sea and all over. What happens? We go as tourists. Astaghfirullah. Where is the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He says, you are not allowed to enter there unless, and the condition is made mention. What is the condition? You should be weeping and you should be fearful of being punished in a similar way. Then you may go to learn a lesson. So you are allowed to go. It's not like it's prohibited. But the condition is you don't go there with your you know, cameras and everything and say, right, here's the Sphinx. Let me stand next to it. You take a picture of me and the Pharaoh. A'udhu billah. What's this? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. This is what's going on today. People want to go to Petra. And what do they do there? Sadly, they're not even dressed correctly. And sadly, what happens? Perhaps may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. They would miss their salah. They perhaps may not even fast if the fasting month is there. And just because they are in Petra and other places on tourism, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson rather than making us people who go there in order to have fun. That is not the teaching of Islam. So this happened at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now we want to make mention of some of his miracles. These are miracles given to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On this expedition of Tabuk, just after they crossed Madai and Saleh, when they crossed the place where the Thamud was destroyed, they were very, very thirsty. And it was very, very hot. And there were no clouds, no rain. And the Prophet ﷺ made a dua for rain. Very, very few moments, the clouds came in and it began to rain. This was a miracle the companions make mention of. They say, it rained so much, we drank water and we filled all our little containers of water with water and we still had a surplus. This was one of the miracles. Another miracle, the Prophet Wasallam's camel was lost. As he had stopped somewhere, the camel disappeared and they were looking for it. Where is it? So one of the hypocrites comes up and says, look at this man. He claims revelation comes from the sky to him and he doesn't even know where his camel is. And the Prophet ﷺ got up and he told his people to the amazement of this man and everybody else that this camel is stuck by the rope that, is, that it has upon a branch in the valley which is not very far from here in this particular place at exactly this spot. Go and see it and get it. 
They went there, they found it exactly in that condition and brought it back. Subhanallah. And this is when they were silenced. They knew when Allah informs Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam of anything, Subhanallah, he knows absolutely everything. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him the news and he informs it to us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him and he gives it to us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors and grant us goodness. Another miracle, also a prophecy. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, tomorrow it will be very windy and the wind will be so severe. Please can all of you sit down and you need to make sure that you've tied your camels and you need to make sure that you don't get up. The following day the wind began to blow and it blew so hard. Those who were seated, all of them say, one man decides to get up. He was blown by the wind to a distance by the mount. And this was also a prophecy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the expedition of Tabuk. Another prophecy, or should I say another miracle. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is a prophecy and a miracle. Powerful, very powerful because we see it today. When he got to, he was getting to Tabuk, he said, in Tabuk, he's telling his people, there will be a well. Wait, don't drink from it until I come. When he got there, some people had already started drinking from it. Perhaps they didn't hear. When he asked them, he told them, look, I told you not to do this. Anyway, there was very little water in it. He took a little bit of that water, washed his face and hands, and returned the water back into the well. Suddenly, it started gushing water. After the water that he had used was thrown back into the well, it started gushing. It gushed to the degree that the water was so much and it flowed, it became a well. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu anhu, O Mu'adh, if Allah gives you life, this area of desert shall become green. You know what? Go to Tabuk today. You will find the place, you will find gardens that are as green as ever. Perhaps you might think you're in Europe. Have you known that? Subhanallah. This was a prophecy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we can see it even today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may he grant us a lesson. Another miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on that day. They ran out of some food and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu says, O messenger, instead of cutting these animals, why don't we all bring whatever leftovers we have, put it together, you make a dua, Allah will grant us barakah. It was one of the miracles given to him, just like it was given to the Prophet Isa or Jesus, may peace be upon him before him. So they brought all their leftovers. Everyone bought, brought whatever they had had and they put it all together. And the Prophet ﷺ started feeding them one by one. They all ate and they brought back whatever they had had in terms of containers and they filled it with food and everyone went back with more than what they had come with. Subhanallah. This was a miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the expedition of Tabuk. Now, from amongst those who were with them were also some hypocrites. Some of these hypocrites uttered some statements. What were these statements? When they looked at the messenger and they looked at all the companions, they said, we've never seen more greedy people than these and people who have greater cowardice than this, we've never seen. Allah informed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of the statement. He called them. He said, what is it that you said? What did you utter? So Allah informed him. If you are to ask them, they will say, we were only joking. We were only messing around. You see, today we use the language. We were only messing around. We, we were just joking. Come on. It wasn't a serious statement. Allah says, tell them, Abillahi wa ayatihi wa rasulihi kuntum tastahzi'oon. You found nothing else to joke about than Allah and His Messenger and the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that what you want to joke about? You want to joke about Allah and His signs and His Messenger? La ta'tadiru. Don't present your excuses. Qad kafartum. You have entered the fold of disbelief after you were believers. They were instructed to repent. The lesson we learn today we have a lot of jokes. MashaAllah, people like to joke, you know, to make people laugh. No problem for as long as it's within the limits. We do not joke about Allah or His Rasul or about any of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
We find jokes of heaven and hell and so on. These are among the category we've made mention of because they are the signs of Allah. If you take a look, what are the signs of Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be careful how you joke. Sometimes we suffer as a result of these little jokes that we send that are blasphemous without us realizing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. You know, you have people and I have seen jokes sent to me as well. And sometimes when you tell a person, brother, this is not good, they, be they become angry. But if you take a look at the type of jokes we send sometimes, you know, a man died, he went to heaven and he had this problem and that problem. May Allah protect us. Why do we need to joke about that? Can we not find something else to joke about? So this is the lesson we draw from this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. Yes, a moment of laughter is good, but not whilst it is in blasphemy against Allah and his Rasul and the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Prophet ﷺ got to Tabuk, now you see why we were saying the incidents that occurred on the path were far great, far greater than what happened in Tabuk itself. When they got to Tabuk, the enemy had already heard of the masses of the Muslims. They ran away. The Romans ran away. Nowhere to be seen. Where are these people? Nowhere. And as they are pro proceeding, the, the different tribes who are connected to the Romans now pledge allegiance with the Muslims and sign treaties with the Muslims and say we want to be under your protectorate. So the Prophet ﷺ took what is known as jizya from them. Jizya meaning a tax. For what? A tax in lieu of the protection. Which means if you are a Muslim, we protect you with our wealth. The wealth that belongs to the nation. And if you are not a Muslim, we will protect you if you pay a tax. If you don't pay a tax, you are under no protection, no guarantee. Your life is at risk. So people who think jizya was something that was made compulsory upon people as a punishment and so on, the response is no. It was a tax in lieu of protection. So much so, at the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, some of the tribes whom he could not protect, he returned their jizya to them and told them, look, we've taken it from you, we won't be able to protect you, so here it is, you take it back. Subhanallah. So it was in order to be protected under the Muslims, this was known as jizya. And they fell under the protectorate of the Muslims under Islamic law. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was the supreme leader. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So they had found, subhanallah, they spent 20 nights in Tabuk. The enemy was nowhere to be seen. They had disappeared. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them that they returned without a war. There was no actual fight in Tabuk because the enemy had dispersed. But Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu was sent with a few men in order to deal with a few of the people who had sided against the Muslims in the past and so on. And in one of his escapades, he caught a man known as Ukaidir. This Ukaidir was one of the leaders and he was wearing a big cap. So the people looked at his cap, the Sahaba. They were amazed by this cap that he was wearing, a big hat. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, don't be amazed by his clothing. The clothing of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu in Jannah is far better than anything that this man has got on. This is another mention of Sa'd ibn Mu'adh radiallahu anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and lesson. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam returned to Medina after having spent, as we said, 20 nights. And on his return, he was given verses by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connected to two things one connected to the masjid that was be, that was built by the hypocrites that he was being called to bless as they were leaving for Tabuk so on his return verses were revealed exposing the whole scenario secondly verses were revealed exposing the hypocrites one by one and telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam يَعْتَذِرُونَ إِلَيْكُمْ إِذَا رَجَعْتُمْ إِلَيْهِمْ they will present even more excuses when you get back to them. <coughs> and how to deal with these hypocrites. So firstly, let's make a quick mention of what happened with that masjid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مَسْجِدًا ضِرَارًا وَكُفْرًا وَتَفْرِيقًا بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَإِرْصَادًا لِمَنْ حَارَبَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those people who have built 
a masjid in order to harm the believers and in order to spread disbelief and in order to disunite the believers and in order to wait in ambush for those who may be weak or for the believers who had very recently accepted Islam in order to instill doubt in their hearts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they will promise you they will swear an oath that we only intended goodness yet Allah bears witness that they are liars this was something it exposed them completely and they didn't even know they were waiting still and now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam receives another verse La taqum fi abada Don't ever read a single salah in that structure Not even one La masjidun usisa ala taqwa min awwal yawmin ahaqqu an taqum fi That masjid which was built from day one on piety Is far better than this particular one Which was that masjid? Masjid Quba it was built by the messenger. This was built right next to Masjid Quba. And the hypocrites had intended to spread disbelief. It wasn't even for a good reason. It was in fact, the history of it is how Abu Amir al-Rahib and those who wanted to be leaders in Medina before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, they teamed up together and they said, let us create this place so that we can make a base for us and soon we will be able to spread because he built Masjid Quba, we can build another one. Then we, in the same way he got his power thereafter, we will also get power thereafter. It was a power struggle. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came back these verses were read to these men and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Ammar ibn Yasir with a few other companions to destroy the structure and to burn it. And up to this day, if you go to Medina Munawwara, it is actually a dump yard at that particular spot because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يزال بنيانهم الذي بنوا ريبة في قلوبهم إلا أن تقطع قلوبهم the building that they have built will continue to remain a doubt in their hearts. And they doubted it completely. The other verse that is revealed regarding the same masjid, Allah says, they built it in such a way that it's about to fall. And it will fall with them in the fire of Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us and protect us. That was a lesson that was learned by the Muslimin and the exposure of the hypocrites. And they were exposed in a way that they had had no way to save face. So much so that uh, this man, Salul, he fell ill and he actually died. After some time, he fell ill and he died in Dhul Qi'dah. In the month of Dhul Qi'dah, he actually died. He was the leader of the hypocrites. And when he died, the Prophet wasallam met his son. His son was a very pious companion. His name was Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. This was a very... Com pious man known as radiallahu anhu he says oh messenger my father has passed away can you give us a shirt of yours to use to cover him so rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as much as he did not want to do that but in order to honor the son he gave his shirt and the son says can you lead the janazah can you lead the janazah so the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not want to do that but he decided to move forward umar ibn al-khattab radiallahu anhu comes to him oh messenger don't you know there are verses which tell you you're not supposed to lead the janazah on these hypocrites? The Prophet sallallahu says, the verses revealed are, lahum, aw la lahum. Seek forgiveness for them or don't seek forgiveness for them. Even if you seek forgiveness for them 70 times, Allah won't forgive them. So the messenger says, so I have the option of seeking or not seeking. I will seek forgiveness for them. So as he went, he led the salatul janazah then verses were revealed thereafter saying wala tusalli ala ahadin minhum mata abada wala taqum ala qabri don't ever read salah upon any one of these people and don't ever stand at their graveside none of them and from that day the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam whenever there was one of the hypocrites who had died he was nowhere to be found so someone else led the janazah. So much so that he told Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu, Oh Hudayfa, this is a list that has been revealed to me of names of people who are not Muslim pretending to be Muslim. So he gave him the list. And he told him, do not let anyone know. 
Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman kept the secret. He did not let anyone know. But Umar ibn al-Khattab and a few others, radiyallahu anhum, when they found out that Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman knows the names of the hypocrites, they went to him, please tell us. Please, we beg you, tell us. He said, no. So then Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiyallahu anhum, says, well, I want to know, is my name from amongst them? Allahu Akbar. Is my name from amongst the hypocrites? And he was told, no. Subhanallah. So, look at how worried they were. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiyallahu anhu, says, after that, I used to watch Hudayfa. If he was at the janazah, I used to go. If he was not there, I did not used to go. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson from this. Inshallah, tomorrow we will be looking at one of the most important lessons also that we draw from this particular battle of Tabuk, where there were three people who had stayed behind without an excuse. They regretted it so much that they cried. They cried and they sought forgiveness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only forgave them 50 days later with verses of the Quran in a very, very emotional story that perhaps we will enter into tomorrow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us lesson from the seerah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors until we meet again tomorrow. We say, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.